I am Professor Sims and this video is for the revised Microlab semester project. The project has been retooled in order to replace the original semester project and I want to make sure that if you are enrolled in this course, please consult the syllabus and the Moodle site for more information. The original semester project for this course, the Unknown Organism Project, was designed to be a multi-lab, integrative, inquiry-based application of several of the learning objectives included in the course curriculum. However, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, it became impossible for that project to be completed in its traditional form. Therefore, the semester project has been retooled so that students can complete virtual online simulations and do research into the scientific literature and accomplish many of the same learning objectives. For example, this project allows for students to gain background knowledge related to microbiology and food safety, uh, collect and interpret scientific data, quantify bacterial specimen, model the scientific method, and evaluate control methods for microbial growth. And it allows for students to do this in an interactive and engaging format which is in line with the foundation that was laid earlier in the semester, student learning in an applied and active learning environment. The project consists of two main parts. The first part consists of using microbiological experiments to test for the presence of a specific toxin in corn. This image shows mold called Aspergillus flavus growing on corn animal feed. In addition to this being just gross, uh, the mold is producing a mycotoxin called aflatoxin. If this aflatoxin is eaten by farm animals or even by humans, it will poison them. Aflatoxins are among the most carcinogenic substances known to man. Aflatoxicosis, which is the name given for poisoning via aflatoxin, damages the liver, suppresses the immune system, and can sometimes cause cancer or death. Here is a short video discussing aflatoxins and aflatoxicosis. In nature, many microorganisms can cause disease, some by infecting our bodies and producing toxins others by producing toxins in our food that make us sick. One group of these microorganisms is called molds, and they can grow on foods and animal feed to the point that we can see them. While growing in grains, nuts, and fruits, some molds can produce harmful compounds, known as mycotoxins, that are invisible to the eye. Different mold produces different toxins. Some are called aflatoxins, others are called fumonisins. When temperature, moisture, and other conditions are right, molds can grow on crops or food and produce these toxins. If you eat food contaminated with mycotoxins, you can become very sick. Symptoms of sickness will be different, depending on which mold was growing on the food. Other factors that influence the symptoms include the amount of the contaminated food eaten, the age, and the health of the affected individual. Mycotoxin poisoning may become worse if the person ingesting the contaminated food is already sick or malnourished. Some mycotoxins can cause the disease as soon as the contaminated food is eaten, with symptoms that include nausea and vomiting. Other mycotoxins can have a long-term effect from low amounts of exposure over a long period of time, resulting in stunting in children and cancer in adults. If a breastfeeding mother eats aflatoxin-contaminated food, the baby's health can also be affected. Mycotoxin exposure can increase the chances of individuals to suffer from diseases caused by other microorganisms, and it can worsen the effects of malnutrition. To recap, here are some key facts about aflatoxin. It is a myc mycotoxin produced by Aspergillus molds. The aflatoxin produced by Aspergillus flavus is the most potent known natural carcinogen. Aflatoxicosis causes liver damage, immune system suppression, and cancer in humans and in animals. Other symptoms of aflatoxicosis include mental impairment, abdominal pain, vomiting, convulsions, edema, pulmonary edema, hemorrhaging, disruption of digestion or metabolism, coma, and sometimes even death. The severity of aflatoxin poisoning depends on a person's age, gender, level of exposure, duration of exposure, 
overall health, diet, and also environmental factors. Now, this is figure 529B from your textbook, and I just wanted to quickly clarify because your text often uses the word mold and the word fungus seemingly interchangeably, but uh, fungus is the kingdom name, whereas molds are the types of fungi. So aspergillus is a type of fungi. It's a mold. Other types of fungi include things like yeast and mushrooms. How does aflatoxicosis occur? Well, the aspergillus molds grow in soil on decaying vege vegetation, hay, grains, obviously corn, nuts. And when the contaminated food is processed, aflatoxins enter the general food supply. So this could be the farm feed, pet food, human food, and what happens is the animals that are fed contaminated food pass the aflatoxin transformation products into their eggs, milk products, meat. Um, given their seemingly unavoidable occurrence in foods and feeds, the prevention and detoxification of these mycotoxins is one of the most challenging toxicology issues of present time. So how do we test for aflatoxin? Well, first, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be completing a virtual lab simulation, and uh, that's going to be at this URL right here. And the first thing is a preliminary test. This consists of viewing corn under UV light, and it's really what it's called is a presumptive test. So if you if you see something under the UV light, you presume that aflatoxin is there. But more testing is going to be needed to make sure it's really aflatoxin and not something else because lots of things can glow under UV light, right? Um, the next step in the testing for aflatoxin in corn is going to be the methanol extraction. Essentially, this step is for converting the corn into liquid form and using that liquid for further testing. So this figure here shows a corn sample, which was positive for the presumptive test, right? And now it's being subjected to methanol extraction. The methanol is added to corn that's been ground up, and that helps to elute pure aflatoxin, which can then be detected using what is called an AFM1 rapid test strip. So this is what the test strip looks like. This is the final step in testing for aflatoxins in the corn simulation. The image shows three test strips. The one on the top is unused. The one in the middle is showing a negative result. And the one on the bottom is showing a positive result. So again, this is the URL here where you will find the testing corn for mold aflatoxin virtual lab simulation. The simulation is going to take you step by step through the entire process. Be sure to note the procedural steps and the results of each part of the tests so that you can include these in your project report. That's going to be very important. So next, the second main part of the semester project involves testing milk for E. coli. Some key facts about Escherichia coli are it is a gram-negative rod or bacilli. It is a common normal flora of humans. Uh, it's a facultative anaerobe. It inhabits the gastrointestinal tract of warm-blooded animals. E. coli is perhaps the most studied bacterium. It's a model species for many studies, also an indicator species for many studies. In fact, it is an indicator species for this experiment. Um, the vast majority of E. coli strains are helpful commensal bacteria. In fact, mutualistic E. coli of our microbiota produce essential nutrients like vitamin K. Uh, this figure here, figure 10.1, shows an electron micrograph of E. coli, and it also mentions here that E. coli may acquire genes encoding virulence factors, which convert them into pathogenic strains. So some strains, and, and strains is basically, a strain is essentially a subspecies. Some strains produce a Shiga toxin, which perforates cellular membranes in the large intestine, and that causes bloody diarrhea. Other strains of pathogenic bacteria, or I'm sorry, pathogenic E. coli, cause what is known as traveler's diarrhea. It's a less severe but very widespread GI disease. Foodborne pathogens such as E. coli 0157H7 are among the most common sources of GI disease. Sources of foodborne pathogens can be difficult to trace 
and then once they are tracked down, this is where you hear of uh, food recalls. So recently we've had some recalls due to E. coli being in lettuce, things like that. You've heard those. This figure here shows an overview of common symptoms associated with GI disease, including inflammation, swelling, cramping, diarrhea, fever, and dehydration, and malaise. Milk from a cow is uh, laden with bacteria sometimes, but not always, including E. coli. The way the bacteria gets into the milk, well, it can be from the skin on the teats of the cow. Sometimes it's directly from the milk itself if the cow has a mastitis uh, or a bacterial infection of the udder. Commonly, bacteria such as E. coli can get into the cow's milk via fecal contamination. Fecal contamination can lead to other types of infection as well, including pathogenic strains of Clostridium, or Listeria, or even norovirus, for example. For these reasons, the risk of an outbreak caused by raw milk is at least 150 times higher than the risk associated with pasteurized milk. Uh, here's a short video discussing the dangers of raw milk. Unpasteurized or raw milk from cows, sheep, goats, or other animals can carry bacteria that can make you sick, like Salmonella, E. coli, Campylobacter, and Listeria. Pasteurization heats milk to a high temperature for a short period of time, which kills disease-causing bacteria. These harmful bacteria usually don't change the look, taste, or smell of milk, and you can only be sure that they're not in your milk if it's been pasteurized. Some people believe that drinking raw milk is more nutritious and more easily digested. Or they believe that pasteurized milk creates problems like lactose intolerance. Many studies have shown, however, that pasteurization does not significantly change the nutritional value of dairy products, nor does it cause lactose intolerance or allergic reactions. And you could be endangering your health if you drink raw milk. How do we know? because hundreds of people have gotten sick from drinking raw milk over the past decade. Pasteurization is used to kill pathogens and reduce the number of microbes that cause food spoilage. There are two different methods of pasteurization, which is known as HTST and UHT. Since the 1920s, pasteurization has been widely used to increase food safety and extend product shelf life. Pasteurization uses heat to remove 99.9% .9 of bacteria from perishable beverages like juice, beer, kosher wine, and of course, milk. There are actually two different types of pasteurization used today in the dairy industry, HTST pasteurization and UHT pasteurization. Neither method significantly reduces the nutritional benefits of milk, uses any chemicals, or causes allergies. Here's a quick comparison. HTSD stands for high temperature, short time, and it's the most commonly used type of pasteurization across the dairy industry. In this process, raw milk is heated to the required temperature of 161 degrees Fahrenheit, held for 15 seconds, and then rapidly cooled to 39 degrees. With Organic Valley HTST milk, expect a shelf life of between 16 and 21 days after pasteurization. The other method is called ultra-high temperature pasteurization, or UHT for short. It's a much hotter and faster process. Raw milk is heated to approximately 280 degrees Fahrenheit, held for just two seconds, and then rapidly chilled back to 39 degrees. The big, noticeable difference? UHT milk has a shelf life of almost three times that of HTST milk, 40 to 60 days from the day of production. In HTST pasteurization, milk is heated at 72 degrees Celsius for 15 seconds, then it is bottled and refrigerated. In UHT pasteurization, milk is heated at 138 degrees Celsius for two or more seconds, then it is sealed in an airtight container for up to 90 days and doesn't require refrigeration. What you'll need to do is complete the testing milk for E. coli simulation, which is also known as the bacterial sampling simulation. Be sure to make note of all of the procedural steps and all of your test results, and make sure to answer all of the guided questions in the semester project report template. And again, that URL is found right here. I want to thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to do the reading, check the description down below for more videos related to these topics, and leave your questions for me in the comments.